Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next The Promised Neverland anime review. This one's going to be for Season 2, Episode 2. And interestingly, it doesn't seem like the, uh, the Season 2 episodes of the anime have titles for the episode. Um, there, were, there were a bunch of numbers, I think, for Season 1, but they seem to just call it like Episode 1, Episode 2 here, so that's uh, fair enough. But anyway... Uh, episode 2 I thought was really good. Uh, I was very happy with the amount of content it covered from the manga. This time we covered 4 chapters from volume 6, so we're still not through volume 6 yet, but obviously the big thing to note there is that the first episode covered like 8 chapters, this one covered 4, so you know, uh, a big change up in the pacing, and I think that's fine. Uh, and, and a lot of people are talking about the pacing, and that, like oh the pacing was better in this episode. My thing is just that, like, no, the pacing was different in each of the episodes, but it was suited for what each of those episodes was covering. It was fine to have fast pacing for the content covered in the first episode, because it was a, in my mind, slow-paced section of the manga that would have really slowed the um, anime down if they gave it a lot of time. So blowing through a lot of that early stuff was a good thing to do slowing it down here for much more important content our first big like world building reveal about the nature of the world outside of the farms and um, covering you know the very significant meeting of our characters or escapees with Sanju and Mujika here of course you have to slow things down to focus on these specific moments and in that sense this uh, this episode was very accurate to the manga uh, in my mind, like flicking through the manga again, it didn't leave out any scenes of particular note. There's probably one scene, and it's just like a, a quick two or three panels between Sanju and Mujika, which I'm guessing they probably will include in maybe the next episode. Um, and that they just selectively decided, okay, rather than having this small section of them talking to each other, we'll wait until later on and, and have them talk to each other. Um, the only other thing uh, I noticed was um, when Sanju was explaining basically the old tale about the, the nature of the world. In the manga they do show panels uh, in the background of you know like demons and humans fighting and you know it, there's visuals to kind of go over it. Whereas in the anime, of course, it was just the characters in the moment talking. He was literally just telling them a story. Um, that, I thought that was an interesting decision. But I suppose, from their perspective, the visuals in that manga chapter were kind of vague. There weren't very specific visuals in that you are meant to take 90% of what you get from the scene, from the explanation, from the text, very little of it from the visuals of that scene. We'll get a much more detailed explanation of sort of the the nature of how things happened later on in the story. This was just meant to be a basic, you know, so you have a sense of what's going on. So uh, I didn't particularly mind that too much. Otherwise, I, I, I felt like they, they included all of the key, like, character interaction moments that you would expect uh, in terms of you know, we jump straight in with Ray and Emma in the corridor with Mujika, Sanju's behind them, and it's this really tense moment because, okay, they saved them, but they are demons. Have they just saved all the kids to, like, keep them there to eat uh, uh, whenever they want? But no, the, the eventual reveal is after a few tense early moments. Sanju and Mujika are just nice people. Uh, they specifically don't eat humans, which is kind of a major reveal that they have certain perspectives on what demons are because of the demons they've encountered up to now. Now suddenly they've met two demons who for religious reasons don't eat humans, um, which is, is, is kind of fascinating. And then the scene towards the end after Sanju gives Emma the hunting training, uh, very much is presenting that idea of, you know, demons eat humans to, you know, live, to survive to a degree, and Emma realizing that when she eats meat, she's also, you know, basically killing other living beings to survive, and just kind of understanding that sort of 
hunter's perspective on things, and but still wanting change. And, and that's what the significance behind, you know, this pretty devastating reveal on the outset, like it seems, when they reveal that, oh yeah, where, where did you get 30 years from, thinking that something happened in the last 30 years to create this, this situation? No, the world's been like this for 10,000, uh, no, what is it? Uh, the world's been like this for at least a thousand years. And he just tells her that you're, uh, you're from a human uh, breeding farm, basically, on the demon side of the world. There is a human side of the world, but you can't go to it, at least as far as I'm aware, you're not able to transfer between both sides of the world. So we get quite a lot of information revealed here about, okay, they ultimately take the huge positives from this, which is that there is a place they can get to where they can be at peace. That is the promised Neverland, I suppose, is getting to the human side of the world where they don't have to worry about being hunted by demons. But you also get some kind of, I suppose, interesting sort of inner demon dynamic here between, okay, clearly he's viewed as a heretic because he doesn't eat humans and kind of wishes things were the way they were before and doesn't like the, you know, the, you know, the, he doesn't like the idea of like growing humans and that's how they have humans to eat. It, it, it presents a very interesting view on like, okay, there's, there's conflicts within like demon society about what is the right way to do things because the way they establish it is that before the promise was made where the two sides would separate, humans hunted demons just as much as demons hunted humans. Um, and so it got to a point eventually where the humans were actually the ones who had the advantage and the decision was made to separate the worlds and a part of this was obviously that back then they felt demons require humans so we have to leave some people behind to act as sort of a sacrifice to make this happen and so they established that you know the an your ancestors were left behind on the demon side of the world so that's a kind of sort of tragic thing in nature of just these people from the past just kind of sacrificed to satiate the demons basically uh, going through the the eras here and um, which is it's kind of interesting to think about for where like for a thousand years like the you can track sort of the lineage of like Emma Ray and everyone back to this time period you know so some interesting stuff to think about of course um, so, so a lot of that stuff was uh, really, really cool. Uh, but it also is like, okay, so where did they get all the information about the actual human world if they're on the demon side of the world? It, it, it straight away establishes that, like they figure out, through William Minerva and the information that he has, there is a way to get to the human side of the world. Otherwise, where would some of the stuff that they have actually come from? That... Like, like the demons to create a situation where you have farm systems and you have you know kids growing up in these farms thinking they're still in a human world how did the demons do that if they don't have access to human like stuff so that's kind of important in all of this um but you know that th that's a major thing to kind of learn the significance of that that you know, we knew that there was more than just, you know, it's the house and the perimeter, that there's kind of more going on here. They don't go into the full details yet on, like, how many farms there are, but obviously suggesting there are more than one. So, uh, I think probably in the next episode, I think there is a little bit more information coming, if I remember correctly. There's a few kind of key reveals coming up next. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> other than that, like, um, you, you have just... The, the whole crew of kids here, the escapees, getting on really well with Sanju and Mujika. Uh, Mujika just seems like such a kind character and, and just seems so nice to everyone. They seem to get on well with her. And Sanju, despite being the sort of warrior here, is also very nice to everyone. And so they learn some of the survival skills, some of which they already knew from the book from before, which is how 
the anime did it where like they didn't get caught in the snakes of Alva Panera um, and they went on to explain here so so I, th I thought that was kind of interesting to just you know kind of slightly alter things that like the anime did differently like in the first episode and continue it on here and um, that that was quite cool but you know it, it helps to establish how they're going to have to do a few more days walking because he he tells them on the map that like okay you have to go over here that's this many days the best way to get here is to go around this path to do that you'll need to learn how to survive on your own out in the wilds and so they get the survival training they need how to light fires how to cook food um you know what plants are fine which ones aren't because again like we learned here this is these humans learning about demon plants and how to survive in a demon forest that's the significance it's similar but it's quite different also like the 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 fact that they go into detail on, say, the Gopna, the, the ritual that the demons use to sort of, um, it's a, I suppose, religious kind of hunting ritual with the Vita plant, which, of course, has its significance in the fact that back in, like, the first episode when Emma saw, you know, Connie, it was, she, she had that plant in her, and now we know what that means. And, uh, and so it establishes that okay, the demons are these monsters and stuff like that, but it's just that, the like is stated in the episode, eating humans is special to demons. So it's, it's, it's not just this sense where like they happen to like the taste and they're just obsessed with food and stuff like that. There is a, a, a deeper significance there to sort of like why, say, humans were left behind on the demon side and why it wasn't just that they were completely separated. But then it asks the question of, wait, if they're so significant, is there no impact on Sanju and Majika because they don't eat humans? Like, Sanju seems very powerful based on how he was able to rescue Rei in the first episode. So he's not, like, diminished because he doesn't eat humans. So what's the deal? Um, and so that immediately creates, you know, what is so special about Sanju and Majika? Something about their religion that's very different than the rest of demon society but you know more on that i suppose later on in the series um but yeah the the, the a lot of the interaction i think between the the kids is actually quite good of like you know what happened in the first episode was basically emma collapsing without telling anyone that she was actually suffering from anything and it was also ray going off on his own to distract everyone and put his uh, life on the the line and I like the scene where Gilda scolds Emma and then some of the other kids scold Ray for you don't have to do it all on your own. We have to work together. You have to communicate with us. You don't have to put it all on your backs to do this. And I, I think that's a really good thing over the course of the series that we learn is that Emma, Ray... Um, and Norman, I suppose, to a degree, back in season one, they all felt that, like, to a degree, like they are the top three in the in the farm. They are the ones who should lead, but not realizing that they're the top three. But four, five, six, seven, eight, like they are the top farm. Like these are the top like thirty kids, basically, on this side of the world. They're all really capable, and even though some of them are young, as we see. You know, some of the younger kids are better at the archery than, say, Don was. Um, they can all be useful <laughs> in their own ways. And just realizing that, that, you know, th that, that was sort of the significance of the scene in the first episode with, like, Don and Gilda teaching the kids how to um, form groups to do an organized escape from demons with the hand signals and so on. Is that they have taken up the role as sort of, you know, the, the secondary leaders of the group. Stuff like that is is kind of significant. Um, we also did have a scene where Emma, I suppose, got across what the plan is. That now that they have a sense for what the world, what's going on with the world, their plan is to go to zero uh, six uh, thirty two. I think is the number that spot on the map. Now that they know where it is, uh, talk to William Minerva, find out details from him about how to get into the human side of the world. And once they've sort of settled down, they can organize the situation to go back in time um, 
to make sure they're on time to get uh, Phil and the younger kids out from the farm. So you, you can't forget in all of this that there is sort of a time crunch on the series. Now, the time crunch is obviously that they don't harvest the kids until they're six, if I remember correctly. And so basically the kids that have been left behind are the kids who are like, uh, you know, four and under. So they've basically got two years uh, if they want to save everyone. And, you know, that's the, the time crunch overall on the series. Um, not that it's, I suppose, too significant at this point, but it, it, it was nice that they did just have that scene to get across that don't forget that the likes of Phil and some of the other kids are still back at the farm. And um, not everyone escaped. That was the one sort of thing they had to... Um, you know, Ray was being so realistic. He was like, only the, the top five kids can escape. But uh, the, the compromise, I suppose, was that, okay, not everyone can come, but much more than you think Ray can come and, and so that's the situation that we have but there's a plan now there's a confidence that they can survive out on their own and now Emma specifically very kind of key scene she learns from Sanju how to hunt the sort of rituals behind it and it was a significant scene of just um her stabbing that Vita plant into the heart of that bird and she says she's fine afterwards, but, you know, clearly that, that's a significant moment for her, is realizing that what she has just done to that bird, you know, it's different, but it's, it's, it's more similar than she wants to admit to what the demons did to Connie and her brothers and sisters from before. Just kind of realizing that, like, harsh reality of, like, what you need to eat to survive and if you eat meat you are ultimately involved in the killing of a living thing interesting dynamic with regards to the idea that you know you know one way of referring to the the, the kids here is like they are this sort of like cattle children because they're being bred for food they're being raised happily on these farms because they need their brains to be um as um, intelligent as possible, which is, I suppose, a clue as to why it's all significant to, to them, like, because Sanji specifically notes the brains are the key part. So I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover in this review. So they've been my thoughts on season two, episode two of The Promised Neverland. In the comments, let me know what your thoughts were, but that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.